Hi everybody, welcome back. This is Unit 1, Topic 6. We're talking today about the Secretariat, one of those key organizations set up by the UN Charter, this one to oversee the UN. And just like when we looked at the member states and the expansion of member states over time a couple of weeks ago, there was no real understanding of what the Secretariat would become. Today, it's an organization overseen by the Secretary General, that's the same as 1945, but a Secretary General who is much more general than Secretary. In 1945, that person was much more secretary than general. In this case, the secretariat now has more than 44,000 employees around the world. Started off with about 300. They knew it would expand, but not like that, not even close. So let's take a look at the secretariat uh, and the role it plays in the United Nations and why we need to pay attention to it. Uh, so WITAN, WITAN, uh, that to me stands for what is the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations uh, is something that uh, I asked you to define uh, in that pretest, what is the United Nations. And a couple of people mentioned that there was a bureaucracy to it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that means uh, that you understood there was a secretariat or just that there were lots of organizations. The tricky thing is this. It's unclear when people talk about the United Nations what they mean. And the reason for that is that uh, there are times when the membership itself, the, the member states, are acting but the majority of times, the secretariat and the professional organization is overseeing the activities that are deemed important by the member states. So what you have is a, a sort of a duopoly of the UN being a collection of member states and the UN being an organization that carries out the will of the member states. The question that's not completely answered now, uh, even now, is whether the organization part ever acts separately uh, for, or distinctly from the member states themselves and I think in the case of uh, of all these organizations there has to be some because it's not as if the member states are micromanaging uh, going forward. So as we look at this map let's pay attention here to this side down uh, the left which were the principal organs delineated in the UN Charter. You'll see in this flowchart some of them have multiple uh, reporting lines but in this flowchart there's all kinds of subsidiary organs, uh, commissions, departments and offices that report back into uh, one of those main bodies but the one that has the most reporting back to it is the Secretariat. The Secretariat's not the member states, right? It's the professional body and those uh, don't represent the full complexity of the organization because if you take something like the UN Office of Drug and Crime which is down here in this uh, uh, box reporting into the Secretariat you'll see that the UN ODC itself has this complicated a structure. So when you're talking about getting to such a large number of employees of the UN Office on Drugs, uh, of the, sorry, the Secretariat, you can see that uh, the UN ODC alone contributes a whole bunch of these and all the other different organizations do something similar. Um, it's complex and complicated, but these are things that the UN member states have asked the Secretariat to do. You won't find much in here that is a uh, Secretary General or a uh, uh, executive director of the Office on Drugs and Crime saying I'm going to have this sub office, this field office here or there. All that comes through a dialogue between the organization and the member states. So when you talk about what the UN is, it's uh, 193 member states and a bunch of uh, of observers and other people contributing uh, dialogue. We'll see in the next unit the role that non-governmental organizations play. But it's also this gigantic structure of uh, professional staff uh, that operate under the, gui uh, uh, under the auspices, under the guidance of the Secretary General. So let's look at the Secretary General from 1946 to the present. Uh, so there's only been nine Secretaries General in the history of the United Nations. It's a five-year renewable, uh, uh, re re renewable position. Uh, tends to be that folks serve up to two terms. Uh, certainly the last two who were the uh, these two here, uh, Ban Ki-moon and Kofi Annan, both serve two terms, but uh, this gentleman here, Boutros, Boutros Ghali uh, of Egypt, he served one term. He ran afoul of the United States, and even though technically speaking, the member states are neither supposed to have uh, suasion over the Secretary General nor uh, direct input in a political manner. They are subject to votes and to vetoes by the Security Council, so it was clear that he wouldn't be uh, re-elected. Um, you'll see that uh, all nine of the Secretaries General have been 
men. Uh, to uh, some of the organization's credit, it has not always been uh, European. In fact, it's least commonly been a European, though three of the first four were uh, Sweden, Norway, Myanmar, uh, and then Austria across the top and then across the bottom, uh, Peru, Egypt, Ghana, South Korea, and now Portugal. Antonio Guterres is the current UN Secretary General. He was uh, not quite a consensus candidate, but a lot of people were really interested in him becoming Secretary General because he has headed the UN uh, uh, Office on uh, Refugees uh, for about a decade. And with the current refugee crisis, uh, ongoing, it was considered uh, of, of real interest to the member states to have someone who intimately understood the refugee crises and the process for hoping to relocate, resettle, and basically take care of refugees around the world. Uh, <clears throat> so the Secretary General, the job started as pretty much someone who was providing uh, secretarial or conference services. They were there to essentially serve the member states when they asked for a meeting, for example. So that those first few terms uh, of the first Secretary General, uh, he basically organized conference services. I mean, there were 300 people working for the Secretariat uh, when the UN started. And, and after about six months, it went up to 3,000, but it still wasn't an overwhelming organization. Their job was to organize the meetings that the uh, member states were going to have. That's still an important role of the Secretariat, but it's no longer an important role of the Secretary General. It is a peculiar job because as time went on, the job became more general than Secretary, and essentially turning the person uh, uh, here under Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, this fellow here from Sweden, I think I said Sweden, Norway, it's Norway, Sweden, uh, the Swedish uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was uh, someone who was beloved in the organization and who take, took a main role in trying to mediate and mitigate amongst member states. He was someone who offered the UN's Secretary General's good offices. So good offices is a concept in international diplomacy where uh, sides who are in disagreement, uh, whether they be member states of the UN or not, would trust someone as an independent arbiter. That's one of the reasons why you ask the Secretary General not to become enmeshed in domestic politics uh, anywhere. So the Dag Hammarskjöld, he was a trusted uh, individual who could go in and negotiate using the UN's good offices. It really begins to change the role of the Secretary General into something that's more of a leader, but still maintaining that important service role to the member states. So it's not just, a, it's never going to be just a general, uh, but it's no longer also just a secretary. Uh, and so Secretary General is this peculiar combination of talents uh, that a person must have. And I'm going to ask you to watch the bonus bit. Uh, it's uh, it's called A Day in the Life, essentially, of uh, Secretary General. And it's from a few years ago with Ban Ki-moon and what he had to do in the course of a day. So the UN Secretary General. Um, the Secretariat itself, we think of as having operations at the headquarters in New York City. But this is a map of where the main offices of the Secretariat are around the world. So if you look at this map, you can see that they're on all the continents. They have all kinds of uh, main offices and headquarters locations and sub offices. And if you look beyond this, then there's field offices uh, that report into the sub offices. So it truly is a global organization. So your Secretary General is someone who has to be uh, able to direct a, uh, a massive organization of 44,000 people. So this, though, is one of the complaints that, in the United States in particular, when people look at the UN budget, this is one of the complaints they have. So reflect back a minute. 1946, your first Secretary General, he's got a staff of 300 people. It's an organization, if we look way back up at this chart again, uh, that has primarily the main bodies down the side, the principal organs, and all those other things grow over time. Each time they grow, the budget of the UN has to also grow. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this unit, the budget is paid for by member states based on their proportional share of the global economy. In other words, if you have uh, X, per X percentage of the uh, gross domestic product or gross national products of all the aggregate uh, economies, then uh, you have that share of the uh, of the UN budget. So that puts the United States today at about 
It also means that there's, uh, if you look at the bottom 120 or so countries, uh, in terms of how much of the global economy they make up, they uh, constitute about 1, 1.3% of the UN budget. So if they can set the budget in the General Assembly, then they're essentially binding the United States to pay for something they may or may not want to, to do. So if the question is, is it in the U.S. interest to have all of these departments, offices, uh, com commissions, and subsidiary organs or, and other bodies or not? Uh, and that's a tricky question. So there was an attempt by the United States, which worked for several years, to try to get the budget, the resolution that leads to the UN budget, to be something based on consensus. And it, when you're in the GA, uh, General Assembly, and you're deciding something by consensus, that would mean that rather than having a majority vote, that everyone collectively agrees to the budget. And if you collectively agree to the budget, then whatever's in it is in it. Uh, and, uh, but that's been gone for about five years now. Uh, they stopped agreeing to it, and they hadn't agreed to it earlier. But what it means is that this organization can continue to expand with the United States stuck, losing its um, sovereignty, its sovereignty to spend its money the way it wants, to a group of states who comprise a very small percentage of the global economy. Now, you may think that's fine. You may think that's unfair. I don't have the answer to you for that, but it's a concern and something of interest regardless to think that as the UN system expands, as the role of the Secretary General expand, so too does the, the responsibility of the United States to pay for it. Uh, so where else does it exist? So the United Secretary General, I'm sorry, the Secretary General has to staff uh, even Security Council meetings. So this is a picture of the UN Security Council chambers. So the member states who are uh, on the Security Council sit around this. They're flanked in here by a couple of representatives of the UN uh, Secretariat. There's more staffers sit down here. Across the bank of windows up here are uh, translators and there's various other employees of the Secretariat there as well. So even in the Security Council, you've got to have the Secretariat there. Um, for example, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, they're the ones that when the Security Council says, we must send a force to this place, then they don't then go build the force and lead it themselves. They turn it over to the Secretariat and the UN Office of uh, Peacekeeping, UN Department of Peacekeeping Affairs. So it, it's a complex, complicated relationship. What does it all mean ultimately? Well, theoretically, Anybody who becomes an employee of the Secretariat surrenders their national affiliation. That if you're an American and you go to work for the Secretary General uh, or in the Secretariat, wherever that is and whatever it looks like around the world, you're supposed to then be in the service of mankind, not, an, not being an American, not being someone who reports back to the U.S. Uh, in any way. Uh, believe it or not, over the Cold War, that's not how these things worked. And there were uh, plenty of examples of particularly the uh, Warsaw Pact states, trying to get people in authority in the United Nations so they had allies in high places in the Secretariat. Uh, does it happen as much anymore? Depends. Certain states have um, part of their diplomatic mission, their overseas missions. Uh, their foreign affairs is to do what they call soft power. What they want is for figures from their country to be seen serving the broader needs of the public and so you may sponsor someone to get them into the UN maybe even give them a subsidy to help them live in New York City or Geneva where it is uh, you're not going to then ask them to report back to you but the fact that they are say Cuban helps you in your standing with other states Cuba's done this really cleverly uh, not just with the secretariat but in coaches and engineers and medical personnel train them send them out and have them represent Cuba so that when it comes time for negotiations uh, at the United Nations, for example, and Cuba has a perspective, then you're like, yeah, I feel good. Cubans have done a lot for me uh, over the years. So it's a, it's a clever thing. Um, and in the current context, much different than what happened during the Cold War. Regardless, day-to-day -day operations at the UN are carried out by professionals, not states. So when you talk about the UN, yes, it's member states. Yes, it's professionals. Those pros are supposed to balance uh, organizational and personal priorities with state goals. Not talking about the goals of their state, but the 
the goals of the states collectively who say this is the direction we're going to go this is what we're up to uh, and uh, make that work so that's the secretary's job that's the secretary general's job uh, and how you decide to answer that question what is the UN and what role you give the secretariat and the uh, secretary general is up to you to decide over the course of the semester cheers <laughs>